and do the review while you're finding your seats, and uh, we will be off to the races. So this is part three. Welcome. In part one, we took Billy's life from his birth in 1918 through his conversion story and the revival meetings of Mordecai Ham, and then college at the Florida Bible Institute in Wheaton, marriage to Ruth Bell, and his first pastorate. Uh, Western Hills Baptist Church and a little radio show in the basement there where he became friends with Bev Shea. We also, in the second week, talked about his transition from pastoral ministry to uh, Youth for Christ, a sp- uh, national speaker, an international speaker for Youth for Christ. He took a brief stint, about a four year stint, as president of Northwestern Schools. Um, that is a different name now, and I don't have that for you, but... Um, uh, University of Northwestern. Thank you, University of Northwestern. And after the meeting last week, um, I heard from Roger, and I also heard from Tom Peters, who has connections with that school. Um, uh, and there's an, a new family at our church that is just recently coming from Northwestern School. So there's several connections there. Um, and they did describe it as a, sort of like Taylor... Um, type of school. So that was some answers to some questions at the end of, of that session. And last week we talked about the his transition from Youth for Christ to the Billy Graham Evangelism Association and the meeting in Modesto where they talked about their core commitments to avoid pitfalls common to evangelists. Uh, we talked about that last week. We also talked about a faith crisis that he had as one of his close, close friends decided that he had doubts about scripture that um, put Billy in an awkward spot. He starts to uh, wrestle with this and comes out um, very confident in the reliability of Scripture, and he sticks to that his whole life. Um, And then we talked also about the Watershed Crusade in Los Angeles, 1949, um, where there is a lot of media attention. It gets a lot of momentum and um, sort of uh, skyrockets him onto the, the national stage in the late 40s. They start making films. He has a national radio show now. And last week we talked at the very end uh, about a gaffe. He was invited to the White House where President Truman, and it didn't go very well, um, sort of broke that relationship, and he was never invited back. Uh, Later on, he did apologize, and they um, mended things, but um, he was never never close to Truman. And we're going to continue to see uh, how he has relationships with 11 presidents over the span of his life, um, some of whom he's closer to, some not as much, but they're all, he, he knows them all. Tonight, we're going to do our best to try to get this from getting carried away. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we need more than four weeks. We need more than four hours. And um, I was thinking to myself, if I was trying to just wrangle Billy into four hours, what am I doing? <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, he's not going to fit. And so there are going to be there are going to be things that we talk about in just a flyover manner. And if that piques your interest, then I can just tell you go dig in the books. He's super fascinating. He's super encouraging. Um, but if you're more interested in politics, there's whole books written about Billy and the president and the presidents. Uh, If you're more interested in religious history and his effect on American evangelicalism, I mean, there's that that whole side that you can explore for a while. Um, If you're interested in his institutional legacy and um, and all of these different institutions, we'll talk about some of them tonight, that that he created and are still ongoing, uh, you could study that. If you're interested in how his kids have turned out and their ministries after Billy has left the scene, you could explore that for for weeks and weeks and weeks. So we're just getting to the point where I'm going to have to be really selective and skip over some things, and that that is what it is. Um, I did, in that that selection process, decide. I did make some decisions. And one was I really do want, um, particularly for those of you who have never experienced, like, Billy speaking, I do want to give it, you know, some more time to just hearing the man talk. So a lot, like I've had a show of hands, how many of you all have been to a crusade and have seen Billy live? Look around the room. And that is a lot of people. Now that isn't everyone, which means that a lot of us, of us haven't. And I didn't, 
uh, experience of Billy Sermon until Billy died. And I thought, wow, you know, I think something really important happened. Billy just died, and I've never heard of Billy Sermon. And so I hop onto YouTube like you can these days and find all kinds of old stuff that you couldn't get uh, very easily before unless you had a specialized library. Type in Billy Graham, and sure enough, they put all kinds of stuff up about old crusade footage uh, that is available there. And so, you know, I started to um, dig in there, and I thought, oh, okay, now it's, it makes sense, especially since I only – my only contact with him was, has been was a very old man to get access into um, some of the um, the the attraction uh, that was drawing all of these people in the the heyday of the Crusades to really understand what that all was all about was was pretty important. And I think John, Johnny's here tonight. I think I even made Johnny Miranda watch one of them, didn't I, Johnny? I was like, okay, guys. This man just died. <laughs> you're going to have to, for some of your homeschool homework, you're going to have to watch this. Sorry, but uh, not sorry. Then, uh, so here's it. I'm just going to kind of start moving a little bit more quickly through the timeline, though I'm not going to get very far. I just know it. Here it is. In 1952, he has a crusade in Washington, D.C., and Truman does not endorse it. He's not interested in this, but he does get Congress to pass a bill that allows him to have a religious service on the the Capitol steps, um, and people are starting to realize this guy is an, a national influencer, and uh, we're going to have a religious meeting right here on the steps with Billy. So um, we see him start to be more and more connected to Washington, have more and more influence there. Now, um, he also, at the end of 1952, goes to the front, really, of the Korean War, and visits with troops, and these stories are very touching. Some of them are a little bit scary. I mean, they're, they're in helicopters in places where there were explosions close enough to, you know, move, like they could feel these things. I think he had to wear a flak vest for some of the, <clears throat> the, the talks that he was giving. Uh, there's a story about him going to a, um, a, a hospital, and this guy you know, the doctor whispers to Billy, I don't think he's ever going to walk again. And he's, he's prone. He's face down on this thing trying to heal. And he asks Billy if he could see his face. <clears throat> so Billy climbs down and crawls on his hands and knees to look this soldier in, in the face. And he just thanks him for being there. It means so much to me. And um, he, one of the high-ranking officers that the guy I fought for was there too. He said, could I, could I see you too? And sure enough, he you know, gets down on his hands and knees and looks him in the face. And Billy said, I think I saw a tear fall on that officer's face from the soldier. You know, so it's a very touching thing going to uh, support the, the troops in Korea in 52. Um, 53 through 61 is the Eisenhower administration. He does have a friendship with Eisenhower. He's, he's um, closer to Eisenhower um, than, than Truman, obviously. He's actually closer to all the presidents than Truman. He has a, the most strained relationship with Truman. Um, I'm not going to go into very many details about the presidents. That I'll save for you to go. I can direct you to those things. Um, I will bring up things that are important to the development of the story, but I'm, I don't. And they're just so interesting that there isn't time. So I'm just going to keep moving. In 1953, so I've also I've also pulled out one of the a whole another section that biographers really study is Billy Graham's relationship to race relationships in the United States. So he's a, he's a major influencer. Um, how, how did he interact with the civil rights movement? So in 1953, we see him question uh, some of the, his southern roots uh, and, and really start to, um, well, in, in Chattanooga at a crusade there, he tore down the segregation ropes at that meeting, the head usher quit on the spot. He was furious, but really said, we're not doing this here. And so, but then, you know, the biographers will notice that he doesn't always have the power or the will yet to do that consistently. So later that spring in Dallas, he reluctantly accepts the committee's segregated policy. But we're going to see him move um, over the next space of time toward a, a desegregated deal long before many of the churches did. In 1954, he has a major crusade in London. He's been to the UK before. He's been to uh, England before, but now this is his crusade. There was 
there was a ton of negative press coming up to this. Uh, they, a lot of the people in the media did not want him there. Uh, very negative things written, but he just goes in and does what Billy does. He's able to win people over, and huge, huge crowds develop. He keeps going for 12 weeks. He gives 72 major addresses. Um, sometimes these crusades get bigger than they plan, or he's speaking more often than he had planned. But I read today when I was preparing that 50 out of those 72 major addresses had to be written the day they were given. So he's not only giving these addresses on like that kind of very demanding speaking schedule, he's also writing on a very demanding schedule. And I wondered to myself, how, how come more of that isn't pre-written? Now he has staff that's helping him, um, but he... He says in this London crusade, he lost 30 pounds over the, the course of 12 weeks. It's just, it's just excruciating, exhausting work. Uh, the concluding service at Wembley Stadium had 100,000 people as their attendance record up to that point. Um, and he thought the, the weather was terrible. It was cold. The rain's coming down. It's turning into sleet. He's like, surely this place is going to empty out. But everybody just stayed there. And he said the spirit was amazing. He said 2,000 people came forward in the mud to um, make decisions for Christ. Mm. Uh, after that, he, uh, Winston Churchill reaches out to him, and he has a visit with Winston Churchill. And uh, um, Churchill's just asking him all kinds of in, uh, questions about Christianity. He said, why, why are these people coming to hear you? Um, is, there, is there hope? And, and Billy's just presenting the gospel to Churchill. Um, and Churchill's no stranger to Christianity, so I don't want you to think that he's completely oblivious to Christianity. Billy had known that he had made comments about <coughs> how the church needed to be more vibrant before, but Churchill also had dips of depression, and um, we found out about these things later, and he's asking, asking Billy about what is the source of his hope. The next meeting comes in. They say, hey, your next meeting's here. Churchill barks, he can wait. I'm talking to Billy. <laughs> so he gets a little longer audience with, with Churchill and uh, prays with him, uh, makes the comment that, um, you know, we can say what we want, but I, Winston, Winston Churchill, could have Marilyn Monroe uh, and try to uh, fill Wembley Stadium, and we wouldn't be able to do it. So there's a very insightful comment from a world leader that Billy's – able to do things that they're not able to do. Um, and, and why is that? What is going on here? And a lot of questions about that. So, um, And then Billy in his autobiography says that this London crusade is very important. It, it's their breakout crusade for the world. So just as Los Angeles is the breakout crusade for the United States, the London crusade is the breakout crusade for the world. And you're going to see him on every continent after this. Except Antarctica. 1955, he, uh, the very next year, he's taking a tour of Europe. And the next year, he's in India, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Korea. Oh, and then he's realizing the my words aren't going to last forever unless they're institutionalized in some sort of written form. And so he starts writing books. He founds the magazine Christianity Today which was supposed to be and is and was an alternative to a mainline periodical called Christian Century, which was liberal. He's like, we need another voice at that level of writing in America with a large readership um, that's interested in theology, is interested in social issues, and he um, has his father-in-law, Ruth's father, Dr. Bell, is um, one of the main people at the beginning. Um, and also Carl Henry, if you've heard these names, to get this periodical going. And it sputters, as all magazines do, out of the gate, but then it takes off, and it still, it still exists. Um, in 1956, he publishes articles in Life magazine and Ebony magazine denouncing racism and enforced segregation. So I'm going to keep bringing in, you know, what is his record on um, the civil rights uh, issues. In 1957, there's a very important crusade in New York. They're at Madison Square Garden for 16 weeks, basically the entire summer. Um, and uh, again, we're going to keep bringing in these things about um, race. Reverend, they, they, they're going into New York. They know it's a diverse place. They know they're going to attract a white audience. How can we 
do better. And so they, they asked Reverend Howard Jones, black man, to advise the team. And he said, don't wait for the, the blacks to come to you. Take the crusade to them. And so they had meetings in Harlem and Brooklyn, large meetings, 5,000 people, 10,000 meetings, uh, 10,000 people to try to build a bridge into the black community. Uh, also very important, during this span of time, a movie actress and singer uh, from the 30s and on, Ethel Waters, uh, rededicates her life to Christ, joins the choir, and they invite her to be a soloist, and she She'll continue to sing at points throughout the rest of her career and Billy's career. She becomes uh, one of their uh, musicians. And I couldn't tell how often that was. Uh, That could be something to drill down on. Um, On July 18th, they invite Martin Luther King Jr. to give the invocation, and he does. Uh, On the 20th at Yankee Stadium, which they thought would be one of the closing (laughs) <laughs> the closing keeps moving, right? They keep, they're going to, we're going to close it down. This is the last night. Okay. We're going to be, let's go to a bigger venue. So let's go to Yankee stadium over a hundred. They set an attendance record at Yankee stadium. Over a hundred thousand people show up. Uh, they invite vice president Nixon to come and give greetings from the president and to give a few words. So he speaks for a while. You can find all of that on YouTube if you're interested. Um, and then the stats for this 16 week marathon, they think that they had, uh, around 2 million total attendees. And out of that, remember their word for people who are interested in uh, making decisions for Christ, 61,000 inquirers, people who go forward or write down on the card that they're re- either rededicating or making commitment to Christ. An additional 30, oh, here's the other thing I haven't told you yet, but I'm going to. These were televised, which was another big upgrade. Uh, they had the, it was, they made them worry. It's expensive, but we're going to televise it. And so they estimate that, that 96 million people saw at least one of the meetings via television, which meant they had another 35,000 inquirers um, send in cards by mail. And then um, they got flooded with, with letters. Oh, 1.5 million total letters coming to the offices at, at um, BGEA. They had to hire more staff to handle the volume of letters. So it's a very, very important thing. Plus they're in New York. And so the strategic uh, and influential advantage from, from their perspective of being in a major cultural center of, you know, of, well, of the world, um, uh, what, does it, what does it mean? What does it, what does it do? Uh, now, and, and keep in mind for the timeline, the breakout in, in Los Angeles was in 49. So we're only eight years. I've only just talked about eight years how? How? What is happening, right? How has all that stuff happened? And I just started to feel like a flooded, overwhelmed feeling just um, trying to, to read about what he was doing. I don't know how, how it happened. Now, um, and then, you know, the, this, back to the civil rights thing, kind of waffling or, or going forward and backward, um, there was a controversial decision the next year. Um, because they decided to invite the Texas governor, Price Daniel, to introduce Billy Graham at a two-day crusade in San Antonio. And um, people were like, he's a, he's a known segregationist. And um, in fact, Martin Luther King, by letter, protested, said, you can't have him introduce you at that meeting without harming the black community. Please don't do it. And Billy responded and said, I took heat when I had you, and I'm taking heat to have him. I, I'm not trying to make a political statement, um, and I'm, we're going we're gonna to go forward with this. Um, but it, it, it didn't sit well with folks, and it was hard for their relationship. They, it didn't break the relationship. They maintained a friendly relationship, a warm relationship, some frostiness, they say, publicly. Um, but that was, that was a, 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 a bump there. Uh, also, there was questions too, because Price was up in a um, very important election. I mean, it was right before he's getting reelected. And uh, so it seemed like he was helping him get reelected by having him in that public way in San Antonio. So that gets mentioned. Um, 1959, again, just with the world and also here. 1959, he's in Australia and New Zealand. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Um, he's also in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, 
That's important because there is a, a young man there named Bill Clinton, and he refer references that he was at the Little Rock Crusade. Um, he also, um, uh, Billy makes a trip to Moscow, which in 59, hard to do, controversial step. And he just was meeting with um, Christian leaders there, Russian Orthodox leaders there, um, try not to disrupt the political situation, but try to build, build relationships and really pray. He's there in, in Moscow to pray. I want to be back in the Soviet Union someday. 1960. Let's do another magazine. This one's called Decision Magazine. It's a monthly magazine. I didn't mention this, but Christianity Today comes out every two weeks. Decision Magazine, and that's designed to be a little bit more scholarly, a little bit more um, intellectual, and then they wanted one for like the populace that doesn't want to read the harder articles, but is interested in testimonies and news about the Crusades and and um, Billy's uh, answering questions that people write in and ask. And so this is Decision Magazine. I'm pretty sure my grandparents were subscribers. Maybe you were too. A monthly magazine comes out in 1960. Also that year, he's um, does a tour of the African continent. He's in the Middle East. He's in Europe. He's in South America with Martin Luther King for um, uh, at least one meeting down there in Rio de Janeiro. Um, 61 through 63 is the Kennedy administration. He wasn't super close to Kennedy, but he played golf with them. He was, um, um, they spoke to each other. They were friendly. Um, I don't have time to drill down on that. Maybe next week we can make some more comments about these presidents. In 62, he's uh, back in South America in a very important Chicago crusade in 62. And then um, 63 to 69 is the Johnson administration. He's probably closest to Johnson than he is to any of these presidents. Uh, very, very good friendship there. In 1965, they add another um, African-American to their team. Dr. Ralph S. Bell joins the team. In 66 and 68, he visits the troops in Vietnam. 69 through 74 is the Nixon administration. I'm, I am going to have to talk about Nixon next week um, to tell you kind of what happens with, with Watergate, what, how that affects um, their relationship, how it affects Billy uh, in his career, and because uh, he's, very, he's very close to Nixon too. Uh, in 1973, he's in Seoul, Korea for the largest, he, the largest live group that he ever addressed had over a million people and it was very carefully counted they know there was over a million people can you imagine addressing a million people his his translator um, um, was a student of bob jones and just to tell, give you an idea of how some of the uh, fundamentalists didn't like billy Bob Jones threatened to pull this guy's scholarship if he translated for Billy at this at this meeting, and the guy's like, "I'm doing it. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, I would too. You know, uh, amazing." Seventy four through seventy seven is the Ford administration, and then here's where I'm going to take you to experience some of Billy at the um, Madison Square Garden, and I wanted to go through the timeline quick to contextualize what you're going to see here. Because this is, remember, this is a meeting where Ethel Waters, um, it, or this crusade is where Ethel Waters is. And she's going to sing um, one of her, what will become one of her most famous songs ever. You know what it is? His Eyes on the Sparrow. And uh, she's dearly loved. And you can find later videos of her in her old age singing it again at a different meeting in color this time. This is a black and white. This is black and white footage. But I also, I picked one that's a little bit longer because you can get a feel for the congregational singing that they did with thousands of people. You can get an idea of this. I mean, it's terrible. It's on TV. You can't, it's nothing like being there. But the, you know, thousands of people in the choir. You're going to see Cliff Barrows do the introduction. You're also going to see how savvy they are looking to the camera, right? So they're televised now. They know that they're televised. Cliff is going to address the camera. You're going to see Billy at times look straight into the camera. They knew they knew how to do that um, already in this at this point. So um, without further ado, I'll take you over to that. And this will this is kind of long. We probably won't have time for discussion this week because I'm going to take us right up to our our quitting time. If you want to um, stay after and ask some questions, we can do that. But I was um, 
struggling to get this one into our hour and 15 minutes. So let me go move to our video. Oh, by the way, a word about the books on the table. Those are gifts. I don't have one for every one of you, but if whoever's interested in those books, you can you can take take a book. Those were gifts from someone at Taylor that knew I was doing this Billy Graham talk and said, I got a stack that I would be willing to give away. I said, okay. So if you want to read that, you can take it. Let me start this. Together. 
Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that tonight we all might be conscious that thine eye is upon us. If God can see the sparrow fall, if he has the hands of our head number, we know that he watches us. That he loves us, that he cares for us. And we are told in thy word that he cares for us so much that he sent his only begotten son to the cross to die that we might find forgiveness of our sins. We pray tonight that thy Holy Spirit will draw all men unto the Savior. For we ask it in his name. Amen. In a way, I am slightly embarrassed tonight because I had announced that the crusade was definitely closing on August the 10th. <laughs> As I said, in all good faith, because that was the vote of the executive committee, that was the feeling of our team, and that was our feeling. But uh, I'm sure the Lord didn't change his mind. We just didn't have faith enough to believe. Here it is, into August, the worst month of the year for a crusade. If we'd chosen the time to come, we couldn't have chosen a worse time, humanly speaking and psychologically speaking. And yet, look what the Lord has done. The great crowds of people that have come this past week, the hundreds and thousands this past week that have found Christ, the letters, the telegrams, the telephone calls. And there wasn't one point on our committee or team that felt that one felt that the meeting should go on. I think it was expressed by Dan Connor, Secretary of the Council of Churches, when he said this, that if the purpose, if the purpose of the Church of Christ is to win men to Christ, and souls are coming 
nine, three, and four, and five, and six hundred a night. He said, we cannot close the crusade. And we had to concur that we believe that it was God's will for the crusade to continue until Saturday night, August the 31st. Now, we can't get the garden any longer than that. But I'm not going to announce that it'll close then. I think it will. I'm sure it will. But uh, I'm not going to announce it. <laughs> the ice show comes in here. I think that's the next event in the garden. We may have to have meetings all night. <laughs> But I hope that all of you are going to pray. As you have never prayed, now we need your prayers. We, we expect that the attendance will drop a bit in the middle of August. But we believe that God is going to be here. Like a lady I heard that called up the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, where the president attends church and said, Is the president going to be there this morning? And the man that answered the phone said, I don't know whether the president is going to be here or not, but Christ is going to be here. <laughs> Christ is going to be here. What a hell of a spot Madison Square Garden has become for thousands of people that have had their lives changed during the past 12 weeks. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to Acts, the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, and the 26th verse, and the latter part of the 26th verse. The latter part of the 26th verse of the book of Acts. We read these words. And the disciple, and the word disciple means learner or follower. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now Paul and Silas had been in Antioch preaching for many months. They'd been holding evangelistic crusades getting hundreds of people to receive Christ. They established a great church. And in the region, the people rose about them and began to call them Christ one, Christ followers, Christians. That's where the word Christian was first coined, followers of Jesus Christ. Now tonight, I want to speak on the subject, how to live the Christian life. How to live the Christian life. I heard about a girl some years ago that heard, as a girl, one of Beethoven's sonatas. And she possessed a strong desire to learn to play. She had real musical ability. But 20 years later, her neighbors had to endure and had to listen to her as she murdered Beethoven. <laughs> now what had happened? She had never struggled with the five-finger exercises in the game. She had neglected to learn to play. Now, there are many of you that have a strong desire to live the Christian life. You want to be a Christian. You want to live the Christian life. But you've never learned how to live the Christian life. <clears throat> now, you've been told that you ought to be a Christian. You've been told that you should live the Christian life, but you've never been told how. I heard about a lady that said that she had a wonderful pastor. She said, my pastor's a wonderful minister, he's a wonderful pastor, and we all love him in the church. But for the life of me, I cannot figure out what he wants us to do. <laughs> well, tonight, I want us to see something about living the Christian life. But first of all, first of all, I want us to see what is a Christian. What is a follower of Jesus Christ? Oh, there are many people that have an idea that if you're born in a Christian country, that you're a Christian. Many people have an idea if you have Christian parents, you're automatically a Christian. But the Bible says you cannot inherit Christianity. It's not by faith. 
Christian. Has that happened to you? Has there come a moment in your life when you repented of your sins? When you acknowledged that you were a sinner? When you said, oh God, I'm willing to turn from my sins? And then by faith you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Now that's the starting point. Oh, there are many people that are trying to live the Christian life, but Christ doesn't live in their heart. Because a Christian is the person in whom Christ dwells. The moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and gives you a new moral nature. And you have power and you have strength to live the Christian life. Now, no one can live the Christian life until first he's been to the cross and received Christ to save. Christ died on the cross. Christ shed his blood for our sins. But you must come and receive Christ. That is an act of your will. Intellectually, you say, yes, I believe, but that's not enough. Emotionally, you might have had an emotional experience, but that's not enough. By your will, you must say, I will receive Christ. I will give my life to Christ. But then, after that, something else must take place. The second thing is, a change must take place in your life. The Bible says old things have passed away, the old old things become you. There must be a definite change in the way you live, a change in your attitude, a change in your attitude toward God. You must love God supremely. You must put God first in all the choices and decisions of your life. There must be a change in your attitude toward yourself. No longer are you egocentric. No longer are you selfish. No longer is everything done just for self and to please self. There must also be a change in your attitude toward your neighbor. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And so there must be a change in your life. All things pass away. Behold, all things become you. I heard about a man one time in the olden days that used to hit his horse in front of the saloon. And he was converted to Christ at a Methodist meeting at the Methodist church. And the next day he came to town, he hitched his horse in front of the Methodist church. And the bartender came out and said, what's the matter? You've hitched your horse here for ten years, and now you're hitching it over there. Why? He said, I was converted last night. I received Christ. And he said, I've changed pitching posts. And that's exactly what we should do. Change pitching posts. And if there is no evidence of a change in your life, then you better check up to see whether you're really a Christian or not. Because if your life hasn't been changed, if you're not bearing the fruit that God gives you when you come to Christ, then you better start doubting whether you really live Christ or not. Because the child of God, a change has taken place. Jesus said, by their fruit shall ye know them. By their fruit. What are the fruits? The fruits of the spirit of love and joy and peace and long suffering and all the others. Are you living the Christian life? Have you given yourself to Jesus Christ? Do you know that you had this encounter with him and have the change taken place in the way you live and in your attitude? If not, you may not be a Christian. You may be living in a fool's paradise. You may think that you're a Christian, but you're not. Because a Christian is a person that has received Christ and a change is taken place in the way he lives. Thirdly, a Christian is a person that has accepted a challenge. The challenge of Christ. Christ said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In Moscow tonight, thousands of young people are being challenged. I'm glad to say that the American young people, as far as I can gather, that are there, have not accepted the challenge of communism. But communism is challenging millions of young people. Jesus Christ also offers a challenge. He says, unless you're willing to accept my challenge and to live for me, you cannot be my follower. Oh, in our churches today, we are busy building astronomical figures to turn in our reports, and all of that is fine and good, but Jesus was busy eliminating people. Every time a crowd collected around Jesus and the crowd got too big, he said, wait a minute. He said, if you're going to follow me, you'll have to deny yourself. That eliminated one crowd. Then if the crowd was still too big, he said, if you're going to follow me, you'll have to take up a cross and follow me. Well, that eliminated 
they did most of the rest of it. <laughs> because they didn't want to go to the cross. The cross was the electric chair. The cross was the gallows in that day. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up your electric chair. You have to take up your place of execution. The unpopularity that comes with following me. And most people are not willing to do that. Most people are not willing to take their stand for Christ. Most people are not willing to stand up and be counted when it comes to surrender to Christ. I ask you tonight, are you sure that you're a Christian? Are you sure that you're sinful against? Are you sure if you died you'd go to heaven? Are you sure that you're ready to meet God? In the strictest sense of the term, I ask you tonight, are you a Christian? Are you sure of if I had a doubt in my heart tonight that I was ready to meet God, you couldn't drag me out of Madison Square Garden till I settled it. Make sure. Give your life to Christ tonight. Come and receive it. All right, that's a Christian. Christ dwelling in the heart. A personal encounter with Christ. Receiving Christ as Savior and Lord. That is a Christian. But how to live the Christian life? That's another bit. How to live the Christian life? All right. About 14, I think it was 14 years ago, I got married. For about two years, I wooed my wife. And I'll tell you, that was some doing <laughs> to win her. I worked hard for two years. Finally, we stood up in front of the minister. Now, I could have admired my wife, which I did, but I still wasn't married. I could have thought she was lovely and beautiful and pleased in her, but that didn't make me marry to her. I had to stand in front of the minister, and he said, Will thou have this woman to be thy wedded wife? And I said, I will. And then he pronounced this man and wife. Then will we marry a public decision. I came publicly before a congregation of people with witnesses on every hand and took root to be my wedded wife. I said I will. It was a matter of the will. Just believing in her wasn't enough. Mm. Just going and having Sunday dinner at her folks' home wasn't enough. <laughs> Just loving her wasn't enough. I had to say I will. And just believing in Christ is not enough. The Bible says the devil believes. Just saying he's a wonderful person is not enough. Just going to Sunday dinner at the church is not enough. You must, by an act of your will, say, I will receive it as my own Savior and Lord. Have you done that? But then I found out something that a lot of married, a lot of kids don't think about. The ceremony was only the beginning. Now when you come and accept Jesus Christ, that's only the beginning. Ten years, twenty years, thirty years, forty years, fifty years, sixty years, you live together, you work together, you plan together, your life meshes together. And marriage is work. It's not a honeymoon all the time. Mine is, but yours I don't think. <laughs> Now the Christian life is the same way. You receive Christ. You say to Christ, I will. And the Bible says you're wedded to Christ. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. But now there come the years of following Christ and living for Christ. And if you want to grow, you must follow certain rules. To grow in Christ. Now the Bible teaches that you start out, after you receive Christ, you start out as a tiny baby. Just a tiny little baby. You're not a full grown Christian. You walk in church on Sunday morning after receiving Christ, and sometimes some of the Christians will say, I wonder if he's going to laugh. <laughs> wonder if the poor little thing will hold out. You shouldn't do that. You can welcome these new people and love them and encourage them and help them that they might grow. You're supposed to grow, but here's the tragedy in the Christian church today. The terrible tragedy. When my little boy said his first word, he said, Dad, Dad. At least I think that's what he 
that's what he said. I was told that's what he was saying. That's that. We were proud of that. He learned to talk. That's that. But suppose 20 years from now, he would still come up to me and say, Jab, Jab. There'd be something wrong. And yet there are many of you that say what? You haven't come to this. You're still going around after 20 years of being a Christian saying, Jab, Jab. <laughs> You've been stunted. You have grown. You go to a prayer meeting. And the minister says, Well, let's everybody say a verse right. Somebody says, John 3 16, you say, Oh, she got my verse. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you do. You haven't heard the Bible. And if somebody calls on you to pray, you say, well, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't pray. And yet you claim to be Christian. The Christian life is one of truth. We start out as children, and we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Now, some quick rules. First, the first rule is what is prayer. We have to spend time every day in prayer. The disciples came up to Jesus, and they said, Lord, teach us. Now you have to learn to walk, don't you? You have to learn to ride a bicycle, don't you? You learn to ride a horse. All right, you have to learn to pray. You learn to pray the same way. Lord, teach us to pray. Now remember, in living this Christian life, you don't have to live it alone. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The moment you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you to give you the power, the strength, the wisdom, the courage to live the Christian life. Now the Holy Spirit also helps in your prayer life. The scripture says, likewise the Spirit also helps in our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we are, but the Spirit itself that is intercession for us with groaning that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit helps you to pray. Now may I make a suggestion? There are so many people that say, well, I feel like praying. I only pray when I feel like it. Then you're wrong. You should have a definite time and place every day to pray. Right. You have an appointment, you have an interview with Almighty God. Suppose you had an interview with President Eisenhower tomorrow morning. You'd get up and say, well, I don't feel like seeing the President this morning. <laughs> or suppose you were going to be presented to the Queen. Well, I don't feel like it this morning. <laughs> no, you'd be there. You'd be dressed in your bed. You go and present yourself to the Queen. Well, every day, God, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is waiting. He has given you an audience at any time of the day, and you fail to keep your appointment. How about this this time that you set aside and pray when you least feel like it? The will is involved here, too. You say, I don't feel like it, all right, your, your emotions, your body says, I don't feel like it. My mind says, I don't feel like praying. My will makes me go and spend time in prayer because prayer is work. Prayer is work. And many times you make yourself keep your appointment with God and out of some of those moments come your most precious moments and some of your greatest answers to prayer. Amen. Hmm. And then the second thing is reading the Bible. Now, the purpose of the Bible is to testify of Jesus Christ. The Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, points to Christ. On Thursday night of this week, I'm going to tell you how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible, how to understand the Bible. I'm going to touch on it tonight. Job said, I have seen the works of his mouth more than my necessary food. The Bible says, desire to conceal milk of the work that he may grow thereby. Now, the Bible says that not only do we grow physically, but down inside of you is a soul. <clears throat> physically, you have eyes, and ears, nose, and feet, but living inside of you is your personality. Your soul, your mind, your memory, your personality, that is your soul, that is your spirit. Now, if you spend all of your time on your physical development, of course, you look like you've eaten three pretty good meals today. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't neglected eating today, have you? You didn't neglect dressing, looking in the mirror, taking care of your physical needs, but what about your spiritual needs? You've taken care of your physical needs today, but none for the soul. And the soul is going to live forever. The 
body dies and goes to the grave, but the soul lives on. And you spend all your time feeding your body, but not for the soul. Now, how do you feed the soul? What is the food you give to the soul? It is reading the Bible, the Word of God. And I don't care who you are. You cannot live a victorious life if you neglect my word and Bible study. Every time a person comes to me and says, I'm not getting my prayers answered, I have no victory in my life, I have no joy in my life, I don't have the peace in my life that I know I should have as a Christian, I ask them one question. Are you reading your Bible daily and studying your Bible? Usually the answer, they bow their head and say, no, not very much. God has a message for you in this book. Read it. Study it. Meditate on it. Now here's how to read the Bible. Read it with reverence. It's an interview with Almighty God. Read it with expectancy. Come to the Bible expecting God to speak to you. And read till he does speak to you. Now maybe you'll only read one verse. Meditate on that verse. Maybe you'll read a whole chapter. Meditate on that chapter. Come with expectancy that every time you open the scriptures, God has a message for you. And then read it with dependence. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of this book, and the Holy Spirit can interpret this book to you. And I've come to many parts in the Bible that I did not understand, and I would get on my knees and I'd say, Lord, show it to me. And I found the meaning of that passage on my knees by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to take adequate, adequate time with the Bible. Don't just to read a verse and do it in the duty of a ritual and close the Bible. <laughs> take time. Take 15, 20, 30 minutes. And you ought to do it every morning. Before you leave your room in the morning or before you leave the house, spend a half an hour in prayer and Bible study and Bible reading and I'll tell you the day will go totally different. You'll be walking on air. There will be a joy in your soul. There'll be a spring in your step. There'll be a smile on your face. There'll be a total different attitude to life if you will get in the habit of reading your Bible and spending time in prayer every morning. And then thirdly, if you're going to live the Christian life, there must be discipline in your life. It's a way of discipline. The Christian life is a way of renunciation and hardship Jesus said, Sarah is the gate that leads to eternal life. The Bible tells us that a Christian is a soldier who must suffer hardship. Thou therefore in your heart is a good soldier, Jesus Christ said Paul to him. The Christian is like a boxer who masters his own body and practices self-restraint. And all the way through the New Testament, you read words like this describing the Christian life. Fight. Wrestle. Run. Work, suffer, endure, resist, agonize, put to death. All of these are New Testament words describing the Christian life. It is to be a disciplined life. We have to discipline our minds, the things that we read, the things that we think. No evil thoughts are to come into our minds, and if they do, they are to be expelled immediately. Our minds are to be disciplined so that we don't spend our time reading trash. And literature that does not develop the mind and develop the soul. Or watching the wrong types of television programs. We don't throw our time away. We don't let our minds run idle. Our minds are disciplined. Our tongues are disciplined too. We say, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Our time is disciplined. We redeem the time because the days are evil. These little minutes, so these little bits of jewel that God gives us every day, these little jewels, they can never be recalled. They have to be dedicated to Christ. This body of mine is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in me. The Bible says that with my body there is to be self-control. Self-control. Meekness. Blessed are the meek, said Jesus. That's what meekness means. It means temperance, self-control. I'm to live a disciplined life. Oh, today, how little discipline we have in the way we live. How little discipline we have in our Christian experience and our Christian life. And that's the reason thousands of Christians.
existence of faith, there is no discipline. There must be discipline. And then next to the Christian life, there is the church. You've heard of Robinson Crusoe Christians, haven't you? Trying to live solitary Christian lives, I tell you the Bible doesn't know anything about it. The Christian fellowship is not optional, it's essential. It's commanded. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The Bible teaches that the church is like a vine with its many branches. It's like living stones built together, members of the body of Christ all knit together. Now the church may have its local churches. Well, if you say, I'm a member of a great universal church, but I'm not a member of any local church or assembly. That's like saying, well, I'm in the Navy, but I'm not going to go to any ship. <laughs> like the United Nations. I was over the United Nations on Monday and had a wonderful talk with Mr. Hammersheim. And I looked out of the window and saw those flags of the United Nations. And I said, here's one organization, but it has its many local constituents all over the world in the form of nations and states. Here, we have the great church, the body of Christ, but it has its local branches all over. And one may be called Lutheran, one may be Baptist, one may be Presbyterian, whatever the name may be. It is a place where Christ is preached. It is a place where Christ is exalted. We have to go there and give it everything we have in the work of the church. The church is to worship together. It's a place where we give our tithes and offerings to the work of the Lord. I hope you'll go to church tomorrow. This is Saturday night. Let's all of us be in the Lord's place of worship tomorrow. All across America, let's go to church. God has commanded it, and I want to tell you, you cannot live a victorious Christian life and have the peace and the joy in your heart without faithfulness in the church. Amen. Stand with your church. Oh, there's some people that say, well, I'm looking for a perfect church. Then you'll never find it. <laughs> because if you joined it, if you found a perfect church and you joined it, it would be imperfect. <laughs> you'll never find a perfect church. I've traveled all over the world, and I've seen hundreds of different types of churches, and I've never seen a perfect one yet. And this side of glory, there never will be. Jesus had a little band of men with him. Twelve of them. It was imperfect. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him when the chips were down at the cross the rest of them for him. There is no such thing as a perfect body on earth. Get into the church and get to work for Christ. And then last of all, the Christian is to witness for Christ. Now how do you witness? You witness by the way you live. The smile, the courtesy, the thoughtfulness, the graciousness. You're witnessing for Christ. And if you live a changed life in which Christ is living in you and radiating out through you, other people will be attracted to you and they'll say, what's your secret? You'll say, I know Jesus Christ. And you have an opportunity to witness for Christ. Witness in the home. Witness in your daily work. We're not to be slothful in business, but servants in spirit, serving the Lord. We have to witness by the way we perform our work. We have to work faithfully. If you're a worker in a factory, you have to do it faithfully. And to the Lord, you don't work just for the employer. You don't work just for the union to make them happy. You work for the law. If you're an employee, you work for Christ. He is the one that you're responsible to if you're a Christian. The Bible says that Christians are pilgrims to We're ambassadors for Christ. The Bible says we're a peculiar people, set apart unto Christ. And we have to be shining witnesses in a perverse and wicked generation. All around we see lying and hypocrisy and dishonesty and lust. And we see world that is on every side. Men taken up with materialism. Oh, give your life to Jesus Christ 
and let him live in you and be a shining witness for Christ. Become salt in your community. Become a light in your community. Let the people know where you stand for Christ. Live a clean and honest and pure and wholesome life. I want to ask you tonight, are you a Christian? Are you living that kind of a life? Well, I'm not asking being that Christian influence. I'm not asking are you a member of a certain church. I'm asking you tonight, have you had this encounter with Christ? Has this change taken place in your life? Have you accepted the challenge of following Christ? Are you living a faithful life of the hint? If not, you can start tonight. Right now. Right now. You can say, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I want Christ to come in and forgive my sins and my failures. I want to follow and serve him. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want a change in my life and in my home. I want a change in the place I work. I want to become a light for Christ. I want to become a witness for Christ. I want the joy of living for Christ. How many people claim to be Christian, but they don't have any peace in their life? There's no joy. There's no love in their life. There's no walk with Christ. There's no thrill. They get angry quickly. They're sensitive. They're jealous. They're filled with pride. I tell you, the Christian life was never meant to be that way. Give your life to Christ and make sure that it is in your heart. Some of you give your life to Christ tonight for the first time. Others of you can come and rededicate your life and say tonight, I'm going to surrender my life to Christ anew and afresh. I'm going to give myself to him. All over this place, God is speaking to hundreds and thousands of people. All of you that will come tonight and receive Christ and say, I'm going to begin. I give myself to him. I come to the foot of his cross, renouncing my sins and failures. I'm coming and give myself to him and say, you Lord. I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come out of your seat from all over this great building, from up in the balconies, all around. You come and stand quietly right here in front. And say tonight, I give myself to Christ. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. If you're in a delegation, they'll wait on you. But I'm going to ask you to come right now, while every head is bowed, and every eye is closed, and the choir sings softly just as I am. Men, women, young people. And I'm going to warn you about something. You cannot come to Christ any time you want to. You can only come when the Spirit of God is speaking. And tonight the Spirit of God is speaking to hundreds of people here. He's speaking to you there. You can give your life to Christ right now. And say tonight, I give myself to it. Many of you are church members. Many of you are Christians. But you need to rededicate your life to God. You need to promise God that from now on you're going to live the right kind of a Christian life. You're going to be the right type of a Christian. I'm going to ask you to give your life to it now. From all over the building, hundreds of you, you come and stand here right now. Just get up out of your seat right now and come. Say tonight, I give myself to Christ. We're going to wait. After you come, we're going to have a moment of prayer, a verse of scripture. Say a word to you before you come or before you go. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. You can go back and join them. But you come now and stand here as an indication that you're saying to God, I will, I will trust Christ. The choir is going to sing while they're singing, you come right now. <laughs>
We are technically out of time, but if any of you want to make a comment about that, it's kind of bright, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, you come, you come. I'd like a definition of the victorious life. Victorious life, so you're going to hear a little... So I know if I'm living here. Yeah, <laughs> good, good question. Victorious life is using certain important um, theological terms that come from places we could talk about that. Yes? It's been over half a century since I've seen that much real freedom. <laughs> Her style comment. I was not. I didn't see that coming, Frank. I have to admit. Um, <laughs> um, the, the physical toll that it took on him. You alluded to that. It just, it just. I was exhausted just looking at the schedule that you put up. There. Yes, it's that exhausting. That stupid board looked like it was oversized. Yeah. Um, I mean, it looked like it was just hanging off of him. Yeah, I don't know how it fit at the beginning of the crusade. This is the end. He said he lost 20 pounds in this one. He also made a comment that after the New York crusade, he felt like something left him that never came back. <laughs> so um, it was exhausting, and yet he lived 99 years. And so how does that, how does that work out? So I don't know. Nineteen seventy three, October nineteen seventy three, Pontiac Silver Dome. And uh, I was there at the Detroit Crusade in Billy Graham and I remember it like it was yesterday. And wow. uh, Nikki Cruz was a guest there, the <laughs> old gang leader from New York City. And uh, when Billy gave the invitation I felt like I needed to go forward, but I, I was afraid. I was young, I was thirteen years old. Thirteen years old. And my church was there. My parents were there, but I sat in my seat and I didn't get up. And uh, the very next night, we were watching uh, the crusade on television. And after his uh, talk, I went upstairs that night, and uh, my mom followed me upstairs and came into my room and asked me if I wanted to pray over Jesus Christ. Uh, and I did. Uh, no, it's not like that. So, yeah, just uh, incredible ministry, right? Yeah, thank you for your testimony. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, for me, experiencing it, um, it helps me understand my grandparents a little bit better. And so, um, it, it, like, there's a whole new door opening up into the way I think about my grandparents um, it, that I'm that makes me kind of reflective. Um, also, I, I I grew up with kind of a real sensitive conscience. And so there's sometimes that he scares me a little bit. Like, does anybody live up to the Billy Graham super Christian level? Does anybody know as surely as Billy knows? Does anybody, you know, so the, the, the way that Billy talks about faith and doubt, you know, can, you know, be, be hard sometimes. Now, I did give you just like a, the, the, the tiniest little slice of Billy. And I would like to show you next week an older one, so that you can have like a way to compare and contrast. You know, he's 39 years old here, mm -hmm. and he definitely, though the the template of the crusade doesn't change, the there is there is theological development over the course of his life. There's also a change in um, the his tone, the way that he presents the gospel. He becomes much more conversational as he proceeds through through his life. So um, we could all talk a little bit about how that how it makes us feel you can you know if pastor mark some sunday just came out like yelling like that we could all just wonder how it would go for him right so we were definitely more used to in in this area where we're living in this generation that we're living a much more conversational tone than the you know the real you know um, um, preaching though i have been in places where that that still is the way that it goes on a sunday morning um, and uh, he he didn't make that up. He inherited it too from um, preaching that he sat under his whole life and revivals that he that he had attended his whole life too. But um, um, that's all for tonight. I won't keep you any longer. Let's let's pray and then we'll be on our way. Father, we thank you um, for our our inheritance, and we pray that you would help us to be faithful 
Uh, he's challenged us tonight to be men of prayer and Holy Scripture and churchmen in a deep way. And I just pray that you would strengthen uh, 